for five minutes to discuss the NAS. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It was said earlier by one of my colleagues uh, in the Republican Party that you were gonna impeach Mayorkas no matter what. There was, and, and I'll quote, I think it was Mr. Gonzalez who said, we're going to impeach Secretary Mayorkas and there's nothing you can do about it. What happened to due process? What happened to us going through, we're having a hearing to pr 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 provide evidence, to have discussion? You're saying we're gonna do it no matter what. Let me tell you what a dangerous slope this is. Because you have the votes, simply because you have the votes, you're gonna do it and there's nothing you can do about it. Let me say how dangerous that is when the pendulum swings. When Democrats have the votes and we go back and forth and we impeach people just because we can. No, I disagree, we didn't. There, were, there was evidence to support it. It's, it's my time, it's my time. And I, I, I'd appreciate your respect. So the slippery slope of just because we can is a dangerous one. And we should be very careful of how we approach just because we disagree with someone philosophically, because we disagree with them ideologically, you have no evidence to support why a person should be impeached. And if you are successful, the American people are not stupid. They're watching, they understand. Demonstrate that you really want to fix the border. Someone mentioned a minute ago, what do we do next? Why do we have to wait until next? Why aren't we doing it now? Why aren't we doing it now? Why aren't we funding and providing resources so we can fix the border instead of using this as a way to play political games and make political points? Shame on you. I yield the balance of my time to Ms. Titus. The gentleman yields to Ms. Titus. Thank you. Uh, at this time, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter some things into the record. First, a record of the Texas Tribune article titled, Texas Border Republican Accuses GOP of Using Immigration Crisis for Politics, in which committee member and Republican representing an actual border district, Mr. Gonzalez, rightly points out that Republicans are politicizing the border for political gain. Uh, I also ask unanimous consent to include in the record a CBS News article, in which Republican Congressman- let's, let's Rule on the on the first one oh, sure. uh, with no objection, so ordered. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, I now ask unanimous consent to include in the record a CBS News article in which Republican Congressman Tom McClintock calls Congresswoman Green's impeachment push against Secretary Mayorkas a I quote new and unconstitutional abuse of power end quote. With uh, no objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a Bloomberg News article entitled Mayorkas Uproar Puts DHS in Familiar Spot as Political Football, describing how the Republican sham impeachment against Secretary Mayorkas is threatening the ability of DHS employees and officers to do their job, disrupting DHS operations and hurting their ability to recruit. Without objection, so ordered. I now ask unanimous consent to include in the record an op-ed by Michael Chertoff, published just this week entitled, Don't Impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, in which the former Bush-era DH secretary says, quote, House Republicans are misusing the process to target an official who has done nothing wrong. Political and policy disagreements aren't impeachable offenses, end quote. Without objection, so ordered. I now ask you, Mr. Chairman, for unanimous consent to include in the record a letter entitled Opposition to the Impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas from Former DHS Officials, in which 26 former DHS officials, including numerous officials who served in the Republican administration, urged the committee not to impeach the secretary because the sham impeachment, quote, not only threatens to undermine national security, but sets a perilous precedent that could have dire implications for the stability of our government, end quote. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of time. I got two more. You want, you want me to wait? You got 13 seconds. Okay. Oh, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a News Channel 5 Nashville article entitled Representative Green on Impeachment. 
I can't imagine the founders support anything like this, which demonstrates that Chairman Green had a different standard for the impeachment process of then President Trump. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, the time is up. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Correa for five minutes to discuss the uh, NAS. Chairman, before I begin uh, with the amendment that I'm going to present, I'd like to, uh, with unanimous consent, include to the record a number of men, uh, record a number of uh, articles. First one, United Nations High Commission for Refugees Global Trends Report for 2022. Next article. Without, without uh, objection, so ordered. An article from the Center of Strategic International Studies titled Persistence of the Venezuelan Migrant and Refugee Crisis. Without objection, so ordered. Second article, Biden administration White House fact sheet, the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Next, next article, Biden administration has admitted more than a million migrants into the U.S. under parole policy. Congress is considering restricting. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, next article, uh, record. Uh, from the New York Times, title for People Fleeing War, U.S. Immigration Fight Has Real-Life Consequences. Without objection, so ordered. Next article, USCIS processes Cuban, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans that outlines that nationals from these countries can be paroled into the United States on a case-by-case -case basis. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, DHS FII 22-year in review showing that Secretary Mayorkas put more personnel, technology, and infrastructure, and resources on our borders. Without objection, so ordered. Forward U.S. George Mason University that shows that the humanitarian parole programs helped to address our labor shortage and actually helped ease inflation. Without objection, so ordered. And last article from Axios titled, Funding Deadlock Threatens to Make the Border Crisis Worse. Without objection, so ordered. I'd like to yield now to Mr. Golden. To Mr. Mr. Ivey. My Mr. Partner. Ivey, you're recognized. I'll look the same. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Correa. I did want to reference uh, my colleague I'm from the Ethics Committee, Mr. Guest, drew a comparison between Mr. Santos and Mr. Mayorkas, which I thought uh, was totally missed the mark, and so we pulled this statement he made on the floor at the time he uh, offered the, amend the uh, resolution to remove Mr. Santos from the Congress. I just want to point out a couple of things, since we're both on the Ethics Committee, to show a stark contrast between what we did there and what, what's happening here today. First of all, the Ethics Committee uh, moved in a bipartisan way. All of the members voted for the removal, uh, or for the report supporting the removal of Mr. Santos. Uh, which I think led to supporting the legitimacy of the two-thirds vote that we got on the floor. By contrast, every vote here um, has been along party lines. And not only just today, I mean, when we voted on HR2, and I think almost every other vote we've had here has been along partisan lines. The second big one, though, was the Ethics Committee did a very thorough investigation. We, we went through 172,000 pages of documents, uh, generated a 50-page investigative report, interviewed 40 witnesses. Uh, compare that to what we've done here on uh, a similar constitutional issue. I think they presented uh, three states' attorney generals. Uh, my recollection is one of them didn't say anything as written testimony about impeachment. Would, would the gentleman yield, though? I, I, I'm not my time, and I'm running out of time. Okay. But okay. Um, two made one-paragraph comments about uh, impeachment as far as reaching the constitutional standard. Um, and the, really the only witnesses we've had here that have talked about it have said that this does not rise to that standard. And we've submitted multiple versions of that from other constitutional scholars as well. Another big one though I think too is Mr. Santos's conduct was criminal and he personally benefited from it. And those are the arguments that were generated by the report that we uh, released uh, I think, uh, as Mr. Guest said on the floor, uh, Representative Santos sought to fraudulently exploit every aspect of his House candidacy for his own personal profit, blatantly stole from the campaign, deceived donors into providing what they thought were contributions. Uh, in fact, payments for his, were 
payments for his own personal benefit. I, you know, we don't have anything like that with respect to Mr. Mayorkas. Uh, in fact, we don't have anything that, that reaches the constitutional standard that we've been discussing here today. And I think uh, we've mentioned Mr. Chertoff. In fact, Ms. Titus just put that article in uh, a few minutes ago, but he basically says all of that impeachment's inappropriate here and that um, Mr. Mayorkas, good public servant in a tough job. With that, I yield back and thank you, Mr. Crea, for the time. The gentleman yields. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Kane for five minutes of uh, discussion on the ANS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to yield my time to uh, the chairman after stating that my name is actually Crane, I did, not I'm Kane. Sorry. Thank you. And you're from uh, Texas, right? <laughs> the gentleman yields to me. I, I want to just clarify here. Uh, we've got 400 pages of a report from five uh, different phases of, of several months of digging into this. Uh, to, to imply that it was three states' attorneys general are, are only witnesses that have come before this committee and talked about the uh, failure of the secretary to adhere to the laws passed by this Congress, uh, you know, that's, not, that's not fair. Well, the gentleman uh, yield? Uh, no, no, I'm not going to yield. We haven't, made a, we haven't made a habit of that today, so uh, I'm, right. not, I'm not either. Whenever you're finished. Um, That's not what just I for a question. The, uh, no, no, no. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's really, you know, we disagree. Um, I think even if he was a Republican, if he's, if it's just elections and impeachment is for something different than this, you can have a cabinet secretary get in there and just do whatever the heck they want. And that's, that, that's not what our founders intended. They did not intend for three separate equal branches of government where one writes the laws and another one executes it, that, that somebody in this branch can just do whatever the heck they want. That, 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 that makes no sense. It's, it's not even uh, intuitively obvious to a casual observer. And so, um, there are people out there who say, I mean, y'all had two, the, the, the minority had two witnesses come in here. It was fascinating, though, when we went back to their statements on the Trump impeachment, they talked about policy, even one of them, even policy is a justification for impeachment. But of course, you know, now that it's this situation, that's not the case. And, and I actually played the podcast. So, you know, I played it on the on the overhead. Um, so uh, this is a disagreement. Um, but I genuinely believe at the core of who I am, when you take an oath to, to defend that Constitution, that means the principle of the Constitution of separation of powers is entertained. And I quoted earlier, or someone quoted earlier, a, a case where you know, lawlessness is not, one of the founders said it, I think it was, uh, Madison, um, not not acceptable, and so um, yeah. I, I mean, I I know we disagree, but in my heart of hearts, if this was a Republican, I'd be doing the same thing. And I yield back to Mr. Crane. I yield. Gentleman yields. Um, are there any other members who wish to speak on the Mr. Menendez? You're recognized for five minutes to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to yield to my colleague from New York, Dan Goldman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Menendez. You know, Mr. Chairman, you had an opportunity to address a Republican subject to impeachment. And at the time of Donald Trump's first impeachment, you made a number of statements talking about the high bar for high crimes and misdemeanors, that this did not meet it. And let's just review if the facts. I'll let you respond. Just okay. Because okay. just, I, I just I, wanted to know which one you were talking about because there were two impeachments last time. One with a steel dust. I'm talking that about turned the, out to be the, false, and then the January. Okay, stuff. it's, it's so, my okay. time, and I, I'm, yep. I'm happy to address. I just that, wanted you to clarify which one. Um, because uh, I hear you and many of your colleagues. Um, uh, completely misrepresenting what that impeachment was about. That impeachment did not include, rely upon, or have anything to do with the Steele dossier. Uh, go look it up, Mr. Bishop. It did not. 
It absolutely did not. It started with Rudy Giuliani in Ukraine doing Donald Trump's bidding to try to extort the president of Ukraine to open an investigation that would help Donald Trump's political reelection chances. Now, whatever you think of whether that rises to a high crime or misdemeanor, it was clear based on a bipartisan vote in the Senate that Donald Trump used the power of his office purely for his own personal gain. He did not use it for any official purposes. And even one of his lawyers went on the Senate floor and tried to make the argument that whatever is in Donald Trump's personal interest is in the national interest. And that's why impeachment should not apply. No, uh, you're saying I said that? No, I said one of his lawyers. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. So that scenario, no matter if you want to misrepresent the Steele dossier or any of the, the other uh, red herrings that, that you all cite, showed an official using his official duties for his personal gain, just like every single other impeachment in the history of the United States. And so what we have here is an official acting in his official capacity for the benefit of the public interest as he has done for his 22 year career in government service. And you like to quote Ms. Ms. Perlstein on the other side of the aisle, I believe saying, talking about your, your made up fabricated uh, article of impeachment of breaching the public trust and that she said that that actually could be an article of impeachment. And what she said is offenses against the public trust are instances in which an official is willfully acting for his own benefit or the benefit of his own power or on behalf of a foreign power, which of course was what the framers were worried about when they talked about unworthy men who would take bribes from foreign governments when they created, as Mr. McCall said, what is now the Department of State. So we can disagree on what's going on at the border. We can disagree about how to solve it. Um, that's what Congress is about, and that's what the Senate is going through right now to give the administration the authorities that it needs to be able to address the situation at the border. But you are sitting there saying that he is violating the law by failing to detain every single person who comes over the border when they do not have, what do you mean false, Mr. Bishop? It's in the articles of impeachment. You just listed seven of them. He can't put them all he cannot put them all in detention because they don't have the funding, the resources, or the beds to do it. You are hold, trying to hold Secretary Mayorkas to a puritanical standard that you have never held anyone else to before, including Donald Trump, who let a million migrants go in the United States while he was president, and yet, you say that only when Secretary Mayorkas does it, does it rise expired. to the level Gentleman's of impeachment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Is there anyone further who would like to comment on the amendment in the nature of the substitute? Ms. Clark, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have um, materials that I'd like to have uh, ask unanimous consent to include in the record, it's an article from the constitutional law expert, Mr. Frank Bowman, entitled, Republicans are calling to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Here's why their case is bunk. That explains quite well why, and I quote, there's no case for impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. Without objection, so ordered. Very well, and I yield time now to uh, Mr. Ivey. 
Thank Mr. Ivey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on some of the comments that Mr. Goldman made. But with respect to this um, breach of the public trust uh, article uh, that's in the, the Articles of Impeachment, I just want to refer to what Mike Chertoff wrote, um, who was uh, the predecessor for uh, Mr. Mayorkas. And I suppose by the, the standard um, that, the, that the committee's talking about now, he could have been impeached um, because he wasn't able to stop everybody else crossing the border either. Uh, but he points out, since Mr. Mayorkas took office, the majority of migrants encountered at the southwest border have been removed, returned, or expelled. In fact, since the pandemic era Title 42 policy was ended last May, DHS removed, returned, or expelled more non-citizens than in any five-month period in the past 10 years. The truth is that our national immigration system is outdated, and DHS leaders under both parties have done their best to manage our immigration system without adequate congressional support. Uh, he goes on to say that he doesn't agree with every policy decision made by the Biden administration. There are aspects of immigration strategy that are worthy of debate. But House Republicans are ducking difficult policy work and hard-fought compromise. Impeachment is a diversion from fixing our broken immigration laws and giving DH the resources needed to secure the border. Uh, and I, you know, in your initial comments, Mr. Chairman, you referenced uh, somebody mentioning uh, that HR2 was in Schumer's trash can. That was me. Uh, you left out, though, that I also said that H.R. 2 was in McConnell's trash can, too. Mm -hmm. And both of them said when H.R. 2 was passed that it was too radical for them to take up. So when you all talked about why, you know, why they're doing it in the Senate and not sharing it with you, it's because they had to start from scratch. H.R. 2 was so extreme. Well, and you you rejected, yield? Not yet. Okay. You rejected every amendment, not you personally, but the Republicans voted down every amendment that they offered, even though you, on some instances, said, you know, there might be some merit in that. That's why, they're, that's why they rejected it. So they're starting from scratch over there uh, because of what they got from, it, from us, well, really, House Republicans on this committee. And then on top of that, I just listened to Mr. Uh, Senator Lankford's comments over the weekend. Um, he, I, not from, I don't know him, never, not familiar with him. He sure didn't sound like a liberal to me. Um, but he really did sound like he was deeply concerned about what's going on at the border. He sounded like he had deep Republican roots. He sounded like he had uh, constituents that were worried about what's going on there. But he's anxious and working hard to pass legislation that can make a difference, which is what we've been requesting here, too. And I, if would it's you, all right with... Uh, would the gentleman yield? I, I, it's my time, Mr. Yes, it is. He's Clark, yielding back. Yield to additional time to me, please? Mr. Goldman. It, thank Mr. You. Goldman, you're recognized. <clears throat> thank you. Um, we hear a lot from my Republican colleagues today about how this is our only option. And in fact, if you go to the Articles of Impeachment, page 15, it says, in light of the inability of injured parties to seek judicial relief, impeachment is Congress's only viable option. That's funny. I thought Congress was supposed to pass legislation. I thought Congress was supposed to address the problems in this country through legislation. And I'm not the only one who thinks that, nor are House Democrats the only ones who think that. Senate Democrats think that, Senate Republicans think that, and the President of the United States thinks that. So there are five entities that are involved in the legislating process. Four of them agree that we need to pass legislation. One, the House Republicans are doing everything they can at Donald Trump's direction to sabotage any legislation because you don't want solutions, you just want politics. And I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize Mr. Garbarino for five minutes to discuss the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield to the chairman. Okay. Um, well, interesting that we, we talk about legislation uh, as a solution to the problem. Uh, we did pass H.R. 2. Uh, both out of Judiciary Committee and this committee is a combined bill on the floor, and it is over there. Some say it's too radical. 
Um, but we did do the, the work of passing the legislation. Um, but interesting you say that legislation is the issue. I think I recall the first two years, you know, we got to have immigration reform fixed. I think I recall in the first two years of this president's tenure, the House was controlled by the Democrats. The Senate was controlled by the Democrats. And the White House was controlled by the Democrats. Why didn't you fix it then? You were in total control. Yeah, it's still well, messed up. You're right. Well, well, and then, what's happened is, is well, that the Homeland Security Secretary has said, well, I'm just going to ignore these laws and do what I think. I'm going to take my agenda for immigration because I can't get it passed through the House or the Senate, even when my own party's in charge, and I'll just do what I want. And that's not what the founders intended. Mate, with the gentleman yield? Um, I yield back to Mr. Garbarino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield to uh, Mr. Pfluger. Um, just to set the record straight here on this discussion of resources and not enough bed space, I, I want to ask a question. Has any Democrat been to the facility in Adelanto, California? Okay. So you haven't actually been to the facilities that have 1,940 bed spaces there, yet only eight are full. So this discussion, this argument well, we'll that, there's not enough, that there's not enough resources, that there's not enough bed space, well, we'll jump, this is, I'm, I'm going to continue the, the thought here, it's completely false. That's not the only facility. Let's talk about in 2021, that four out of five beds at the facility in Tacoma, Washington were empty. Let's talk about the 20, in 2021, where DHS spent $12.5 million on a facility in Georgia with unused beds at the same rate. So the detention piece of this argument, the willful refusal to comply with the detention piece of the Immigration Nationality Act is what we're talking about. That is the law that Secretary Mayorkas has not complied with, he has not enforced, he has not done anything in fact, and he had the resources, he had the bed spaces, he had the ability, and he didn't do it. So when I hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and by the way, how many Border Patrol agents have you actually talked to over the past year? How many people have you actually heard from? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record um, the Border Patrol Union document that talks about the fact that they don't have the ability to actually do their job. Um, and this is called agents are not violating the law or following unlawful orders. I'd like to enter this into the record. Without well, objection, so ordered. gentlemen yield for so, a question? I'll, I'll yield, well, I'll yield back to Mr. Garbarino. I, uh, I yield to Mr. Bishop. I thank the gentleman from New York. And uh, there's one other thing to, I think, to add to the cogent point being made by the chairman and then by Mr. Fluger. Um, it is a false is a, a straw man argument to say that Republicans are doing this because and uh, Mayorkas has not detained every single migrant in a particular category. There, there's, and what I endeavored to suggest a moment ago and, uh, was, was that the articles, I, I would ask somebody to point to me the page, to the page in the line where it says anything about every single migrant. What it's saying is, of course, there remains, even when Congress uh, passes a law to restrict prosecutorial distress, discretion from being exercised in a certain way, obviously there are certain circumstances where it can't be avoided. So if an, if an administration is doing its best, if the secretary is doing his best or her best to abide the law, but circumstances prevent it. But when you're reducing the amount year over year that you're asking for detention beds from 54,000, it goes up to 60,000, then down to 32,500, down to 25. Those are the requests of the department. They're creating the circumstances under which they are accomplishing what they want to do, which is preventing themselves from being able to follow the law in the main. They're trying to change the categorization of migrants by which they detain or do not detain. That's different than not being able to detain every single migrant. And I can tell you this, if they were trying, if Secretary Mayorkas were trying to follow the law and there were circumstances that were preventing it, there would be a wholly different reaction from this Congress. I yield back. Mr. Bishop, I would point you to page 16. The gentleman yields and uh, his line time has expired. 17 his time 19. has expired and you are not recognized. Now, is there anyone else who would like to speak on the amendment? Hearing none, are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? An amendment at the desk. 
The gentlelady from Texas has an amendment at the desk. Mr. Chairman, we don't have an amendment at the desk. 117. Point of order is reserved. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HRS 863 offered by Ms. Jackson Lee. Without objection, the reading is dispensed Mr. with. Chairman, I object to waiving the reading of the amendment and ask that it be read in full. We have a motion to dispense with the reading. I, I object. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. 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 The ayes have it. I call for and roll call. We uh, There's a call for a recorded vote. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. McCall. Aye. Mr. McCall votes aye. Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Guest. Mr. Guest votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Mr. Jimenez. Aye. Mr. Jimenez votes aye. Mr. Fluger. Aye. Mr. Fluger votes aye. Mr. Garbarino. Aye. Mr. Garbarino votes aye. Ms. Green. Aye. Ms. Green votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Lelota. Mr. Ezell. Mr. Ezell votes aye. Mr. D'Esposito. Yes. Mr. D'Esposito votes aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee votes aye. Mr. Luttrell. Mr. Strong. Aye. Mr. Strong votes aye. Mr. Burkeen. Aye. Mr. Burkeen votes aye. Mr. Crane. Aye. Mr. Crane votes aye. Ranking Member Thompson. Nay. Ranking Member Thompson votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Payne. No. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter votes no. Mr. Tanadar. No. Mr. Tanadar votes no. Mr. Magaziner. No. Mr. Magaziner votes no. Mr. Ivey. No. Mr. Ivey votes no. Mr. Goldman. No. Mr. Goldman votes no. Mr. Garcia. No. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mrs. Ramirez. No. Mrs. Ramirez votes no. Mr. Menendez. No. Mr. Menendez votes no. Ms. Clark. No. Ms. Clark votes no. Ms. Titus. No. Ms. Titus votes no. Can I ask what the tally is? Can I ask what the tally is? Uh, the, Mr. Chairman, do you, would you like to vote? What's the tally? You have to vote. I, I just hold on. I can ask the tally. On that vote, we had 14 ayes and 14 noes. How am I recorded? The chairman is not recorded. Chair votes aye. Chairman, chairman votes aye. How's Mr. Lelota recorded? Mr. L Mr. Lelota is not recorded. Mr. Lelota votes aye. What's the tally now? How is Mr. Luttrell recorded? Mr. Luttrell is not recorded. Mr. Luttrell votes aye. What else? What's the tally? On that vote, there were 17 ayes and 14 noes. The ayes have it. Uh, the clerk will distribute the amendment.
took longer to do that than the usual. Oh, that's what it is. That's all they would have right at the moment. Got that cardio in there. Mr. Chairman, question on procedure. If the minority is going to require that every amendment they offer be read, not dispense with the reading, I said, let them read it. We can be here all night, is fine with me. We look forward to your vote. <laughs> the clerk will uh, report the amendment. An amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HRES 863 offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas, number 117. The gentlelady is recognized to speak on her amendment. Mr. Chairman, the Founding Fathers deliberated for a period of time to ensure that the American public for ages beyond would be protected. And so their interpretation of impeachment, which by the way, to answer a question poised some many minutes and hours ago, yes, there is authority to do our job. Yes, impeachment does exist. As Professor Charles Black has indicated, uh, it deals with other high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, in particular, impeachment is focused on the idea of treason, bribery, high crimes and misdemeanors. Professor Black notes that in his influential handbook, impeachment is not permitted for mere inefficient administration or administration that does not accord with Congress' view of good policy. Simply put, the Constitution forbids impeachment based on policy disagreements between the House and the executive branch, no matter how intense or high stakes those differences of opinion are. I would venture to say that the disruption of a presidential election in 2020 was not a mere disagreement between Congress and the executive, a direct connection to disrupting the election and changing the election. Nor was an outright insurrection on January 6th could be equal to the idea of a disagreement with Congress. And so what we have here today are two articles with no constitutional basis of charging a secretary or a public figure anything dealing with an unconstitutional violation. It has been nine months since our committee's chair told his donors in Tennessee to, quote, get the popcorn, unquote, for his five-phase predetermined plan to impeach a cabinet secretary over policy differences. Over nine months, the hearings floundered. Not a shrivel of evidence of high crimes or misdemeanors why they wish to not read my amendment, which is to eliminate Article I, because as our Secretary formerly of Homeland Security, of whom I worked with, has indicated, again, he emphasized, Secretary Chertoff, political and policy disagreements aren't impeachable offenses to the American public. He made it as a simple statement of fact. The Constitution gives Congress the power to impeach federal officials for treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors. That is a high bar. <clears throat> and we do not have that. And now, after two impeachment hearings with no Republican-invited constitutional experts, my colleagues across the aisle have rushed to their pre-planned, predetermined conclusion to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. As I said earlier, this is revenge impeachment. I got you. That's despite Republicans not affording Secretary Mayorkas any rights to participate in the process, unlike the previous impeachments of former President Trump. They claim that the Secretary is playing a game of cat and mouse, but my Republican colleagues rejected the Secretary's offer to testify before the committee on a different day. He details that in a very effective, lengthy letter that, yes, we did receive in the early morning hours, but he did provide that with us. 
for us, a day where he was not already planning to host Mexican officials to do what our colleagues want him to do, the job of stopping fentanyl. The meeting was to collaborate on clamping down on fentanyl trafficking and reducing unlawful crossings. Isn't that interesting? Performing his constitutional duties, and he was rejected. And the chair of the, this committee did not act upon our properly entered Minority Day hearing request to call on constitutional experts to discuss this impeachment process. Republican attorneys general masquerading as constitutional experts don't provide an insightful view into the impeachment, just a partisan one, but more importantly, they are not constitutional experts. They deal with the laws of their state, not the laws that we are governed by <clears throat> in the United States, uh, Congress or this committee in particular. They should be guided by the Constitution in as much as states are subject to the power of the federal government that seems to be missing in several of our uh, states today. But I guess Republicans consider the two impeachment hearings methodical. In light of these observations, my amendment seeks to strike Article I of the Articles of Impeachment. The article is filled with unsubstantiated allegations and a general lack of understanding of both historic border policy and U.S. immigration law. My colleagues want to impeach the Secretary for allegedly the not enforcing immigration the law. The gentlelady's time has expired. And I hope to continue by one of my colleagues yielding. At this time, I reserve what I did not have to reserve. The, the gentlelady Chairman. yields. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I'd like to withdraw my point of order. Point of order is withdrawn. Uh, does anyone want to speak on the Chairman. amendment? No, her amendment, Republicans go first. So is there a Republican? Nope, okay. You're recognized, Mr. Magaziner, for five minutes I'll to discuss the amendment. Thank you, Chairman. I'll begin by yielding back to Ms. Jackson Lee. You're very kind, sir. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> Let me say that, again, my colleagues want to impeach the Secretary for allegedly not enforcing the immigration law. Be reminded, my colleagues, that he was attempting to meet with Mexican officials to enforce laws to determine what laws we could work on together, and which he could not be at this uh, particular hearing and uh, was not given another option. They seem not to understand that Congress provides the funding for and sets the minimum threshold uh, for detention levels, and Congress has never provided the resources to detain all undocumented migrants. DHS is currently detaining more people than required by this body, while Republicans refuse to consider the Secretary's request for more funds to further increase the bed space. Similarly, Congress has never provided the resources to remove all eligible non-citizens. No administration has ever requested funding for such a large deportation scheme. We have not even tried to participate in legal, uh, if you will, uh, immigration by providing the necessary tools. I didn't say that they would all be granted for asylum. And so we have a extensive backlog in all forms of assessing the migrants coming across the border. Therefore, Secretary Mayorkas uh, uses prosecutorial discretion in the absence of other tools in accordance with longstanding pre precedent and rightly instructs the officers and agents to prioritize threats to public safety, national security, and border security as the American people would want them to do. How do you protect us, Mr. Secretary? Well, I've been given zero by this Congress. They've done nothing for comprehensive immigration reform, so I'm going to, in my best judgment, as a public servant, following the Constitution, doing my duty, try to ensure that you will have the opportunity to be safe. The prioritization doesn't stop him from enforcing the law. He's already removed and expelled more people than the Trump administration. My colleagues also want to impeach the Secretary for executing his parole authority in a way that aligns with decades of precedent. Every administration since Eisenhower has used parole. Its first use was actually for 30,000 Hungarian nationals fleeing communism. President Trump used parole to expedite the reunification of Cuban families faced long, facing long waits for immigrant visas. Now Republicans want to say it can't be used on a case-by-case -case basis for Ukrainians fleeing Russian aggression or the multitude of different persons that are now coming across the border because, again, there was no stand-up Republican Party to provide the resources, stand up to the cause, 
to provide the resources that would allow for this secretary to perform his job. My amendment affords my Republican colleagues to go back to the table for an opportunity to do their job and to correct their baseless allegations of which I would care for them to adopt uh, their own instructions. Secretary Chertoff said, that is why Republicans aren't seeking to hold Mr. Mayorkas to the Constitution's high crimes and misdemeanors standard for impeachment. They make the unsupported argument that he is derelict in his duty, and they have no basis to be able to suggest that. And Secretary Chertoff goes on to say, the truth is that our national immigration system is outdated, and DHS leaders under both parties, both parties, have done their best to manage our immigration system without adequate congressional support. But no Democrat, during the time that we were in the majority, attempted to impeach our Secretaries of Homeland Security when they respectively had challenges and difficulties uh, sending or returning migrants that were coming to this country. So let me, as I uh, conclude, we have been executing, and uh, this is by way of Secretary Marcus, but no one wants to listen to. We have been executing an unprecedented and high impact campaign to disrupt, dismantle the smuggling organization. More than 14,000 smugglers throughout the region have been arrested and thousands have been prosecuted under federal law. We have worked with Mexico to conduct mirrored patrols along the Southwest border, protection of the Southwest border. And we have worked with Mexico and other countries to increase interdictions along the migratory routes includes repatri uh, repatriation uh, flights uh, and execute the removal of third country nationals. Last year, we secured funding to hire 300 more Border Patrol. We scrapped and scrapped and got whatever we could get. General Lady, your time has expired, so but I, I think Mr. Thanedar is going to yield to you. Mr. Thanedar, you're recognized. One. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Right, Chair. Uh, I yield my time to uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island. Mr. Magaziner is recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you uh, to Representative Tanadar. Uh, I want to speak in favor of Ms. Jackson Lee's amendment. The legal case for impeachment in these articles is incredibly thin, and I want everyone to understand this. In Article 1, the argument that House Republicans are making is that somehow Secretary Mayorkas is choosing not to follow the law because a portion of Migrants apprehended at the border are not being detained until their cases are heard. But again, there is not enough detention capacity because this Congress has not provided that funding for that capacity. Stats and numbers don't lie. For fiscal year 2024, and I want everyone to hear this, Congress provided funding for 34,000 beds in ICE detention centers, 34,000. The average daily population in those detention centers is 37,000 people. They are at capacity. So there may be individual examples of certain facilities at certain times that are not at capacity for safety reasons or health reasons or whatever the case may be. But overall, across the system, we are at and above capacity. And so what should the secretary do? The secretary, because he has not received the funding to provide adequate detention capacity, has to use his judgment for who to detain and who to release. That is not illegal. It is certainly not impeachable. And it is the exact same kind of discretion that every other director before him has used. In the last two years of the Trump administration, 52% of migrants apprehended at the southern border were released, not detained. 52%, nearly a million people. I did not hear my Republican colleagues trying to impeach the secretary or acting secretary under the Trump administration during those years, but here they are trying to impeach Secretary Mayorkas for doing the exact same thing. And in fact, the percentage of migrants who have been released under the Biden administration, 48%, is lower than the 52% rate under the last two years of the Trump administration. In Article 2, 
And that's, by the way, that is essentially their whole argument in Article I, so we can forget that. Article II, they are arguing that somehow the Secretary has lied to Congress because at various times he said things like the border was secure or the border was closed. <coughs> These are subjective terms. Again, certainly not impeachable. If he said, you know, we're holding an average daily count of 37,000 people a day when it was really 10,000 a day, well, that would be a lie. That would be misstating a fact. But characterizing the situation on the ground in a way that my Republican colleagues might disagree with is certainly not impeachable or a lie. If I say to you, it's hot outside and you think it's cold, I haven't lied to you. If I say to you it's 80 degrees and it's actually 40 degrees, well, that might be a lie. Would the gentleman yield? But, but, but I'll just say, once again, you're talking about terms like closed, secure, that are inherently subjective terms. Oh, okay. I mean, it, 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 there are certain terms like, oper was it, operationally, uh, 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 operationally secure that may have a legal definition, but again, the idea that this would be an impeachable offense is ludicrous. There is no law that my colleagues have pointed to that has been broken, and particularly when it comes to the Secretary using his discretion to decide how to manage the lack of capacity because Congress has not provided the resources that he has asked for, he's using the same discretion that every Secretary before him has used. Well, gentlemen, yield quick for uh, Yield to Mr. Goldman. Uh, just to follow up on, on <clears throat> Mr. Magaziner's point um, on the operational control of the border, as that term is defined in the Secure Fence Act of 2006, that, of course, requires zero immigrants from crossing the border in order to achieve that standard. And, of course, that's unreasonable, unattainable. So in 2007, under the Bush administration, the department issued guidelines to redefine what operational control is. So if you are actually trying to point to this and the letter of the law, then you ought to talk to your colleagues in the Wayback Machine in 2007 who changed that definition. The gentleman's time back. has expired. Would the gentleman's, um, Would the gentleman's, the gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Mrs. Green uh, for five minutes to comment on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're listening to Democrats today talk about Secretary Mayorkas um, requesting funding from Congress and talking about detention space. But the facts tell the truth. Secretary Mayorkas has requested less detention space. Fiscal year 2020, 2.7 billion for 54,000 beds, including 2,500 for family units. Fiscal year 2021, 3.1 billion for 60,000 beds, including 5,000 for family units. Fiscal year 2022, he requested 1.8 billion for 32,500 beds. Fiscal year 2023, he requested 1.4 billion for 25,000 beds. And in fiscal year 2024, Secretary Mayorkas re reduced it again down to 1.3 billion for 25,000 beds. This is a reduction of 9,000 from fiscal year 23 enacted. DHS has not provided Congress with statutorily mandated reports on detention needs as required under 8 U.S.C. 1368 and requested by the committee in a letter on January 4th, 2024. Also, DHS claims in fiscal year 22 and 23 budget requests that a reduction in detention capacity level will not impede ICE's ability to apprehend, detain, and remove non-citizens that present a threat to national security, border security, and public safety. Secretary Mayorkas closed detention facilities, closed them, while paroling en masse millions of illegal aliens into our country. By December 2021, DHS stopped using family detention centers for family units. In March 2022, ICE announced it would close an Alabama detention facility and limit the use of three others in Florida, Louisiana, and North Carolina. 
Secretary Mayorkas refused to utilize MPP. But let's talk about what has been the result of that. Human trafficking is a $150 billion a year industry. And what has this done for the cartels? Cartels and coyotes are making over $13 billion a year in human trafficking alone off of Secretary Mayorkas' willful breaking of federal immigration laws. This revenue is 26 times more than cartels earned under President Trump, approximately $500 million under Trump, according to the New York Times. But what is that doing? This is trafficking children, trafficking women. This is what he is not holding these people. He is not detaining these people. He's not coming to us and asking us for more money. He's asking us for less money. He's asking us for less beds. And then he's closing down detention facilities. It is an outright lie to claim that Secretary Mayorkas is following the law when in fact he's not. He is breaking the law and he is paroling them by the millions into the interior of the United States. What else, what else has happened since then? Fentanyl, the number one killer for Americans between ages 18 and 45. Let's also talk about how many Americans are dying. 300 Americans a day are dying. Let's talk about what that does Let's talk about to people like two of my constituents, Jose and Isabel Lerma who were killed in a human smuggling pursuit caused by Mayorkas' open border policies. What about 20-year-old Kayla Marie Hamilton? Remember her mother? Poor Kayla was raped and strangled to death by an illegal MS-13 gang member who was actually apprehended at the border. Apprehended. He had gang tattoos on his body. But because Secretary Mayorkas... Secretary Mayorkas breaks federal law. He says, go ahead and release these people into our country. And this 20-year-old was raped and murdered by an MS-13 gang member who should have never been in the United States. This is the outcome. That's just one example. We could spend hours and hours. Do you know what? We could go all week. And I'm sure, I'm sure Chairman Green would let us do it if we talked about every American who has been affected by Secretary Mayorkas willfully breaking federal immigration law. Is that what we must do? If we must, we must. Mr. Chairman, I yield. The gentlelady yields. I now recognize Mr. Payne for five minutes uh, discussing the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield to uh, Congresswoman Shield Jackson Lee. Gentleman yields. Ms. I, I thank the gentleman, and uh, forgive me, Mr. Mac, uh, Magazine, uh, that I didn't uh, thank you and you yielded. Thank you so very much. Uh, let, let me uh, give us all a, su a, a suggestion. Let us adjourn, move to adjourn this meeting and have an authorization meeting because my heart goes out to every single victim that has suffered a <coughs> loss of life, being, uh, being uh, a family member or who's died in this terrible scourge of drug trafficking or fentanyl. And let's have a meeting that deals with authorizing Secretary Mayorkas $20 billion to be able to do the job uh, that we understand he has not done because he has not asked for $1 billion, $2 billion, $5 billion, $6 billion, $7 billion. It goes to the very point that we are making. These are policy decisions. These are decisions that the Budget Committee participates in, the Appropriations Committee participates in. And it may be in the overall discussion of the budget of this nation or appropriations that the Secretary was given the amount that he could work with, policy. And it wasn't a constitutional decision, it was this is the budget for DHS. And the billions that you are asking or maybe need will have to be dropped down. And so I can't for the life of me see why my colleagues cannot understand that you are dealing clearly with the issue of a policy decision and a very wise secretary 
that is trying to do his job by protecting us in the narrow way that he's allowed to do so. Here are my resources. Here is who I can um, detain. And for the information of this committee, under many Republicans want to use our immigration and criminal justice system uh, to um, solve public health crises or blame the secretary. Under President Biden's leadership, overdose deaths have decreased or been flat each month for six consecutive months. As well, uh, we have reported, um, based on a, tw a rolling 12-month count with significant uh, increases during the final year of the Trump administration. We didn't have that. But Democrats, we've been working to bring it down and to stop the, the scourge of drug trafficking. In September 2021, during the first year of the Biden administration, the DOJ and DEA announced law enforcement surge that resulted in the seizure of far more of these fentanyl pills and other horrible aspects. And so the real question is, how long are we going to pursue a question of behavior under your job versus a direct acts that result in the deaths of people? Are you telling me Secretary Mayorkas was directly involved in killing people? Would we go to that length? Would we so much even uh, suggest that the smugglers and the cartels gaining profits have now rendered under Secretary Mayorkas under Article 2 that talks about the breach of trust? Or has he benefited monetarily? Who would want to stand and say that? And so we're getting to a point now where it really is a question of understanding. And that understanding is that Article 1 does not fit any of the charges that the Republicans are making against uh, this gentleman. They're not constitutionally grounded. And we have not allowed the secretary, who is now engaged in negotiations now for over a month, I believe, or more, with the Senate, a very table that the House Republicans have inv been invited to sit at, the very table that the Speaker of the House has been invited to sit at. And my understanding is that their seats are vacant. But yet our Secretary of Homeland Security, under the threat of impeachment at every point, has gotten up every day to participate in abiding by laws that he hopes will make this country safer. Is that the basis of impeachment? Is that the accusation that will hold under this Article One, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it will not hold. And I ask my colleagues to support the Jackson Lee Amendment and vote down Article One. General Lee's time has expired. I, I now recognize Mr. Guest for five minutes to discuss the amendment to the amendment. Uh, briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, I oppose the amendment. Uh, I do disagree uh, with uh, Ms. Jackson Lee when she says that uh, members of the House have been asked to sit at the table uh, during these Senate negotiations. That is completely untrue. You've not been asked. Ranking Member Thompson has not been asked. These negotiations are taking place behind closed doors in secret, and we have no input whatsoever. And so for any member to say that House Republicans have refused to participate is just a complete misstatement of fact. I also disagree with my colleagues. We may can argue whether or not lying to Congress should be impeachable, but I don't believe we can say that what Secretary Mayorkas has said time and time and time again is not untruthful, is not a lie. I'll give you quotes. Uh, Congressman Pfluger asked him in 2023, is the border more secure under your leadership than when you started? That's Secretary opinion. Mayorkas said, Congressman, the border is secure. This is my time, Mr. Magazine. I'd like to read the statements of your Homeland Security Secretary who has misled Congress repeatedly. I asked him, I asked Secretary Mayorkas, are you saying that all nine sectors are secure? His testimony was, it is my testimony that the border is secure. I later asked him again that in light of the statements made by Chief Ortiz, is the border secure? And he said, Congressman, I stand by my prior assessment. Mr. Bishop asked him, I've heard you and the Judiciary Committee recently this summer testify the border is secure. 
Secretary Mayorkas, do you continue to maintain that the border is secure? His answer was yes. I asked Mr. Mayorkas on another occasion, so my question to you, Mr. Secretary, are you testifying as you sit here today that the southwest border is secure? His answer, yes, I am. And then when questioned at some point by Ms. Jackson Lee, his response was, Congresswoman, the border is secure and the border is not open. In a hearing uh, in which Representative Roy asked him as it relates to the Secure Fencing Act, uh, Congressman Roy says, do we have operational control of the border? Secretary Mayorkas, yes, we do. And Congressman, we're working to, and then he doesn't finish that statement. And so we may argue whether or not that is impeachable, but I don't think we can argue whether or not he has been truthful because his statements in and of themselves are distruthful. How can we say that the border is secure when last month, with the nationwide, Neal, there were over 370,000 immigrants come across the, the border. Yield. Would the gentleman yield? I yield to the chairman. So uh, I also think it's very important to point out, as you, as you brought up the Chip Roy testimony in judiciary, that Chip Roy read the definition of operational control from the law, from the law passed by Congress, and said, do you have operational control by this definition? And the secretary said, yes. In another hearing, he had already said, I, I don't know if it came first, I want to be very clear here, which came first the, before this in another hearing or after, but Mr. Sec Mr. Secretary said, no one has ever had control by that definition. So it's not whether it's warm or cold outside, there is a very clear definition in the code for operational security, he was asked read the definition and asked if we had operational control by the definition, and he said yes. And later or before, and I'll have to get the date on it, uh, he, he admitted that it, no one's ever had control, well, gentleman yields, which, is, you know. which is a false statement. I mean, I, that is a false statement. Well, knowing the definition, knowing that no one had ever had control. In fact, Mr. Biden, just a few days ago, President Biden said he, no one's had control for 10 years. Mr. Mayorkas lied to Congress, and he lied to Congress. The gentleman yield. And uh, I yield back to Mr. Guest. Uh, Mr. Green, uh, thank you, Chairman. In my last few seconds, I do want to reiterate the point that you just made, that the President himself, uh, within the last several weeks, has made statements that contradict everything that Secretary Mayorkas has testified repeatedly. The President of the United States said not only is the border not secure, but the border has not been secured for well over a decade. So the border has not been secured at any time in which Biden has been president. Under his statement, the border was not secured when Donald Trump was president. And under his statement, the border was not secured when he was vice president. And so Mr. Mayorkas has lied to Congress. He has breached the public trust. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak on the amendment to the amendment? Yes, yes Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goldman, you are recognized. So secure is a term of art, as you know. Operational control and secure of the border is under the Secure Fence Act of 2006. The Department of Homeland Security under George Bush in 2007 recognized that it's an impossible standard and they implemented rules and regulations by which the department has operated since 2007 under the Bush administration, Obama administration, Trump administration, and Biden administration. And so when Secretary Mayorga says it is secure, it is secure according to the guidelines that oversee the Department of Homeland Security. Nobody is escorted into this country. But I wanna talk about Ms. Jackson Lee's amendment because um, it is one that I, I fully support and I wanna focus um, on a, a reason that we haven't talked about very much, um, which is the complete lawlessness of this impeachment process. This was referred to this committee for impeachment, but that does not mean that prior impeachments are irrelevant as precedent. Prior impeachments have always allowed for due process to the individual who is being impeached. 
Right. President Trump got it in 2019. And every single individual judge, president, or otherwise has gotten heightened due process standards where they were permitted to provide evidence, provide testimony, call witnesses, cross-examine the witnesses. What we had in this impeachment process was one hearing where the Republican witnesses were all state attorneys general who are suing the Biden administration. Pretty clear conflict of interest. Uh, no impeachment knowledge or expertise. And another hearing where we heard stories, tragic stories from parents of children who have, uh, who have died. And Ms. Green says we should stay here and talk about all of the anecdotes of individuals who have died uh, be from at the hands of those who should not have come across. Well, I'll tell you what would be much, much longer than that is going through every single victim of mass shootings around this country with assault weapons that have no place in our civilian society. Two a day. That would take a lot longer than everything else. So we're here in an impeachment process that has no due process. There is absolutely no legal analysis of any of these articles of impeachment, which are unprecedented and have been made up out of whole cloth. And then in Article 1, which is what we're talking about here, the gist of it, as my colleague from Rhode Island said, is that Secretary Mayorkas has, has failed to secure the border, and the specific examples generally relate to his failure to follow what the law um, and detain everyone. Now, I would add, of course, Ms. Green is wrong in the President's supplemental appropriations request. The President did ask for more funding for ICE detention. He asked for more funding for Border Patrol agents, for asylum officers, for immigration judges, for uh, USCIS officials to process everything because we have such a backlog of the asylum process. But where he's being impeached right now because he did not put everyone in jail. That's what we said. Now, Mr. Bishop then responded saying, no, 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 no. Well, obviously there are some circumstances when not everyone can be detained. And in those circumstances, then not everybody should be detained. So I figured it out. We have the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas because the law says that immigrants shall be detained unless it is the judgment of Representative Dan Bishop of North Carolina that they are exempt from detention. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields in time. Mm -hmm. I thank the gentleman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have votes going on right now. We're gonna recess and we will reconvene at 440. At 440, we're starting back in here. We're in recess.